This is Dr. Matthews. This chapter is on infections of the nervous system and sensory structures. First, this is a list of many bacterial infections that, can, uh, uh, that are a problem with the nervous system. Bacterial meningitis, and there are many different bacteria. Meningococcal meningitis, haemophilus, pneumococcal meningitis. Listeria meningitis, and then tetanus and botulism are actually toxins that cause a problem. And leprosy is listed here as a disease of the nervous system, but not the central nervous system, it's the peripheral nervous system. Okay, bacterial meningitis, the reason it lists it all together is because if you got it, you got it, and it's hard to know which one you have initially. It's going to take some diagnostics and it may be hard to diagnose but initially uh, and it often comes on very suddenly nausea vomiting fever headache stiff neck is a sign you have a kid with a high fever and a stiff neck that's something to worry about or an adult then confusion sleepiness light sensitivity progression to seizures coma those are pretty good signs and less common than viral meningitis, uh, but more severe. You'd think viral meningitis would be more severe, but the bacteria produce toxins, and our bodies are better adapted to deal with a viral meningitis. Early diagnosis and treatment is absolutely essential. Meningococcal meningitis is caused by Neisseria gram-negative, aerobic diplococcus, and about 20% of the population are asymptomatic carriers. Transmission is person-to-person -person or respiratory droplets. Generally, sudden onset within one to three days of exposure, and antibiotic therapy is going to reduce mortality rate by 9 to 12%. percent does not sound like much of a reduction to me. Haemophilus influenza meningitis. Now, Haemophilus influenza is a bacterium. You see influenza, that's the flu. Well, they didn't know what caused the flu. They didn't know about a flu virus when they named this bacteria. Aerobic gram-negative coxobacillus. And it's present in the normal flora of the throat. Uh, there is a vaccine available and it has declined radically in children because of vaccinating the children when they're little. It's about 10% of the meningitis in adults are caused by hemophilus. Transmission, direct contact, respiratory droplets. Intravenous antibiotics, as soon as it is suspected, you don't wait for the culture to come back, you start with it. Vaccination should start at two months of age and then children won't get it. Pneumococcal meningitis is caused by streptococcus pneumoniae. Uh, gram positive encapsulated facultative anaerobic diplococcus. It's kind of a mouthful. It's carried in the throat of many asymptomatic people. It's a huge cause of otitis media, big cause of pneumonia, half a million cases a year. There is a vaccine. Now, if the, if the otitis media were treated plenty early, it might not progress to meningitis. If the pneumonia were treated early, it might not progress to the meningitis. These things go from one thing to another. Pneumococcal vaccine protects against the disease, which is caused by streptococcus pneumonia bacteria. Now, there's two different vaccines, pneumococcal conjugate vaccination for babies and children under two, and certain people over two if they have particular medical conditions. And then there is a pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine for all adults 65 and older, and they're going to need one, and then they're going to need a, a booster. And I didn't see how far apart. I know one person said five years, but I don't know. And it's what 
you normally refer to as the adults refer to as they're getting their pneumonia. Listeriosis is a foodborne illness and it is an animal waste to human mouth disease. It's spread it's by filth basically and handling of food uh, causes meningitis. Now most people that are healthy and young or middle age are not going to get it but the very old immunocompromised weak people or unborn babies get infected. Uh, if the f symptoms in adults is fever, personality change, tremors, seizures, and death. S infection comes through contaminated food and these include anything made with unpasteurized milk, soft cheeses, and then hot dogs or cold cuts that were handled improperly after being cooked. And there have been food recalls on this repeatedly and there have been people that have died because of this. So it's a very serious disorder. And it could cause, you know, it could make you, your, your unborn child die. Tetanus is a acute, often fatal disease and it causes protracted, prolonged contracting of skeletal muscles. So it's a spastic paralysis. They just seize and seize and seize and seize. It's caused by the organism Clostridium tetani. Now generally it starts out, this has to be in an anaerobic environment. So the old classic, the case of you step on a nail, a rusty nail, well, rusty nails don't all have tetanus growing on them, but they could. But anything that you step on or cut yourself with that could be contaminated with these organisms, they're also going to be contaminated with other organisms. So you get a little minor infection of a staph or strep, maybe even from your skin, and it cuts off the circulation to a small area. And then the tetanus can grow, and as it grows, it displaces more oxygen, so it can grow beautifully. And it produces this neurotoxin, exotoxin, and it actually will make people seize so hard that they break bones. They can become paralyzed because they break their back or neck. It's found in the soil and intestines and feces of livestock, horses, sheep, cattle, dogs, cats, rats, guinea pigs, and chickens. And the spores enter the human body through a small scratch. Now here's a picture, and this is a drawing from 1860, Sir Charles Bell drew it, of a soldier with tetanus. And he's in that position, he can't control it. All his muscles are contracted and he can't breathe. And we can't, they couldn't do anything about it then. Now, if it's caught early enough, you could put that person in an induced coma intubate them, put them on a ventilator, and they might have a chance. If you can get rid of the tetanus and get them, uh, and they live for a few days, then they'll be okay. But it's, generally, it will kill you if it's untreated. And my great uncle, who is a college president up in North Georgia, back before I was born, in fact, it may have been in the 40s. This is ancient history, but he died of tetanus. And there is a vaccine, and you're supposed to take it every 10 years, unless you tend to get scratches or cuts, and then you get it every five years. And I always end up getting it at least every five years because something's always biting or scratching me, or you know I'm getting dinged up in the barn. So I go at least every five years. That's the organisms. You see that? That's a little place that didn't take the stain. That would take a spore stain to stain those, the spores themselves. Botulism, second cousin to tetanus, Clostridium, but it's botulinum. And it is very similar, spore forming rod, and it also produces a neurotoxin. And there are four types. Uh, foodborne, 
improperly canned food. So a whole family comes to you with flaccid paralysis. Now we had tetanic or spastic paralysis with tetanus. With botulism, you get a flaccid paralysis. So if a whole family comes to you and they are paralyzed, then uh, chances are that's a good rule out. So always get your history. Infant botulism. People think that feeding raw honey is just the greatest thing. Well, if you feed it to babies, it could have just a few little spores of botulism in them or just a few little chunks of toxin. Their immune system won't take care of it. I'll eat raw honey. It's fine for me, but it's not good for babies. Wound is very rare where you get a wound infected with botulism and then have botulism symptoms. But it does happen. I read somewhere several years ago that it's four or five cases a year in the United States. Inhalation, where you actually are into a whole bunch of it and inhale it and it gives you the disease. Very rare. But once again, in ancient times, you just died. In modern times, if you get the diagnosis and you can get the people on a ventilator because they can't breathe, they may live through it just fine. Uh, if you don't treat it right away, mortality is very high. So it's definitely one of those things that kills you. Leprosy is what it used to be called, but that is not politically correct. It's just you know how we change words. All the way back to the biblical days, they talk about the lepers and how the people with leprosy had to run with a bell in front of them ringing, seeking unclean, unclean, unclean. It's, you know, it's, they were outcasts of society. And so the person, I think the person who identified the organism may have had the name Hansen. So the proper name is Hansen's disease. It's caused by Mycobacterium leprae. It's a chronic, slowly progressive disease, and it affects peripheral nerves, mostly in the hands, feet, nose, throat, eyes. And it's very sad because fingers and toes fall off, chunks of faces fall off, and, and you just live anyway. Very, very terrible disease. It does stop the it kills a sensory nerves, so it shouldn't be as painful as one might think, but it's a, a terribly um, humiliating and bad disease. Treatment can be given, but it's very hard. Not terribly easy to catch, strangely enough. You almost have to live and take care of somebody who has it without any kind of precautions to get it. In fact, family members may live, uh, a, fam a family that has Hansen's disease may have children and they do fine. It has been cultured or found in the foot pads of armadillos. Some people think maybe it is a zoonotic disease and that this was the original carrier. But being as how it is, a, they had leprosy in the Middle East, I don't think they have armadillos over there. so. I think that's kind of a bad plan, but again, don't play with armadillos. Okay, the bacterial diseases of the eye, I won't draw a straight line. Conjunctivitis, also known as pink eye. It could be caused by Haemophilus influenza, very many different microbes, mishandling of contact lenses people who leave them in too long or who don't wash their hands properly, they get infections. I know they used to have the hard contact lenses my sister used to have. And she didn't, if she didn't have the stuff, if the contact got dry and she didn't have the stuff to wet it with, a little saline solution that was sterile, she'd put them in her mouth, stick it right back in her eye. Well, she ended up with enough scarring on her cornea and, and in her eye lid that she never could wear contacts. So she's been in glasses ever since. Neonatal gonorrhea ophthalmia. This is Neisseria gonorrhea. So if a mother happens to be have gonorrhea and she gives birth, then the babies 
eyes are going to become infected. Gonorrhea can infect an adult person's eyes just as well. But it's a state law that all babies get antibiotic drops in their eyes right after birth. It's just better to be safe than sorry, and you don't know who's telling the truth and who's lying and who doesn't know what they got. So you just treat everybody. Uh, other causes, bacteria, viruses, herpes simplex 1 can cause it. And there was a woman that I knew who, whose husband had to put antiviral eye drops in his eye every day. Now here's where I get allergies and my eyes will just get red. And any kind of chemicals you get in your eye or a foreign object. Again, you get eyelash in your eye. I'm out riding horses back when I was riding. I've got bad knees right now, but uh, get a gnats in your eyes. Those will cause serious irritation. Redness, itching, roughness, discharge, tearing, and treatment with antibiotic drops or ointment works fine. Hygiene is the best way to control spread. Now, if your kid goes to school with red eyes and they're tearing, the teacher's going to send them to the school nurse. The nurse is going to have them sit home. And they're not coming back to school till you take them to the doctor and be sure it's not something contagious. Viral meningitis. It's relatively common. Not as common as, uh, I mean, not as serious as bacterial meningitis. It's called asymptomatic meningitis and it is spread by direct contact with infected feces or nose or throat secretions. So if you've been around somebody who's had it, you might get it too. Fever, headaches, stiff neck again, tiredness, rash, sore throat, vomiting. Now there are some meningitis as well as encephalitis that can be spread by mosquitoes. We'll talk about those shortly. No treatment, Hopefully your immune system will take care of it. Poliomyelitis, and it's caused by the polio virus. It replicates in the GI tract, person to person through oral fecal route. So it should with sanitation not be an issue, but there um, was an epidemic around early 1900s up until they had the vaccine, the first half of the 20th century, plus a little change, there was an epidemic with paralytic polio. 95% uh, of the cases are asymptomatic, most are mild, and, and that's kind of where your book ended, which is, you know, it went a little bit further. Risk uh, factors for the severity, if a kid is immune deficient, malnourished, they just had a tonsillectomy, Intramuscular injection, that's interesting. I guess that's tissue damage. And if you're pregnant, in the US there is uh, one type of vaccine that's available for routine polio vaccine in children. But paralytic polio, which was not mentioned much of these PowerPoints, very rare in the US due to vaccination. And I really, really, hope it doesn't come back because of all this anti-vaccination stuff that goes around due to people who don't know. But I've seen older students when I was in school that had polio and it was bad. Destruction of motor fibers, but it left the sensory fibers intact. So therefore they get to enjoy the pain. Their arm may shrivel here, I have one withered arm. Uh, my, in college, my husband had a roommate that had a withered arm, and he was always in pain, and he was really grumpy. And some were paralyzed, couldn't walk. Some died of respiratory failure. They put children in iron lungs, that were these giant things, and they're just laying there paralyzed. And one died after, I think, 50 years in an iron lung. The last one did. 50 years, flat on her back, watching TV. She had books. She had some degree of education, but no quality of life. It was horrible. But her 
parents, you know, really wanted her to keep going. And the electricity went off, and they had a generator, and they tried to crank it, it wouldn't crank. And she died while they tried to crank the generator. Rabies is a very interesting disease. It is a preventable disease. There, is, there are vaccines for human. It's a zoonotic disease caused by a rabies virus. I'm going to mention here on dogs, it is the law that you vaccinate your dogs. They could be started at uh, three months, then they have to get one a year later, and then the vaccines are labeled for every three years. Some counties that have had a lot of cases of rabies mandate that you get them every year. So you need to go by your own county and wherever you take your animal, they'll know. Cats can also get rabies and then spread it to you. Usually what cats do if they get rabies is they just run off and you don't ever see them again. But dogs will come at you if they get it because it makes them crazy. Um, it causes acute encephalitis. Now, if you as a human or your dog or anybody gets it, once symptoms appear, you're going to die. It's deadly. 100%, no way around it, you're going to die. So you, if you are exposed, you've got to be treated. Typical vectors, raccoons, skunks, foxes, coyotes, and I, don't have, I do not have a clue why they didn't mention bats because bats spread more rabies than all these others put together. Theoretically, wolves could get it. And of course, dogs and cats, your dog and cat should be vaccinated. But the biggest thing is that the Cerevar that really, really like dogs, that came in dogs, has been totally eliminated from the United States because of vaccination, because of uh, leash laws, and preventing the spread of it. It can be spread to domestic farm animals. And my first exposure was uh, to a mule. Uh, uh, 400 students were exposed to this mule. He didn't bite us all. We were stupid enough to put our hands in his mouth because the teacher told us to. But anyway, he had rabies. No one thought he had rabies because he had he was just paralyzed. Apparently it could be spread to groundhogs, weasels, and certainly dogs and cats. Now, rats, mice, guinea pigs, if they're bitten by a rabid animal, they're going to die of rabies. They're going to die before it gets to their salivary glands. So you're good. If you're bitten by a rat, you may get an infection, but you're not going to die of rabies. There's never been a case of an armadillo being shown to carry rabies. I'm not sure if they even bite. Uh, possums certainly do, but apparently their body temperature is lower and they're not considered to be vectors. Transmission, saliva from the infected hosts, you know, they bite you or lick you on a wound. And that's why we had to get vaccinated when we touched the mule. It's because everybody has a little ding on their hand and we weren't wearing gloves because that was a few years back before we really used universal precautions in animals. And we still don't. You bring your dog to the vet, they probably don't put gloves on. But if I'm sticking my hand, my hand in any animal's mouth, gloves are going on now. Starts off with fatigue, muscle aches, insomnia, headache, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, anxiety, irritability, agitation, the desire to attack people, literally, and bite them, and then death, always death. Um, there was an epidemic of rabies and back in the, whenever those Dracula books were written. And, you know, Dracula liked to run around and bite people and then they would become uh, vampires and then they'd bite people. I wonder if it's not related. But it can take, depends on where you're bitten on how long it takes. You might get bitten and it takes you six months to get it. Or you may get, if you're bitten on the face, you may get it in just a few weeks. It has to migrate in a retrograde fashion up the nerves to the brain. If you're in a field that, require, that is high risk, 
pre-exposure vaccination is essential. Most now in vet schools, they require you to get pre-exposure vaccination, but they didn't back when I was in there. Post-exposure vaccination will also treat it. But you need to know if you've been bitten, you get it. And all, all four times I was bitten, it was at work. So that worked out very well because I had um, workman's comp on it. And I didn't have to pay all that money. Very expensive. But it's not as expensive if you have ever been exposed, if you've ever had shots before. If you've never had shots before, they're not only going to give you the vaccine, they're going to take hyperimmune serum and inject it directly into the wound. If you are bitten by an animal, you should always scrub the wound thoroughly because you'll get most of the vac most of the rabies out of them. Okay, let's see. Okay, and there is a bat biting a person. It looks like the person's just sitting there holding the bat, which is a little strange to me. But maybe they have had pre-exposure vaccination. Uh, occasionally, we'll get bats in the house and we'll catch them and take them out. Bats are wonderful citizens. They, they catch bugs if they don't happen to bite you. But if a bat bites you, it's considered a rabies exposure if you can't catch the bat. Now, you see that dog slobbering all over himself. He might have rabies. He might have eaten something that was toxic. He might have licked something that was toxic. He might have a really bad tooth. He may have a stick wedged up between his upper teeth. Uh, there's no way of knowing. I had one dog that was drooling like that, had bitten six people. The people refused euthanasia, had it in a cage at my clinic, we left it overnight, came in in the morning, and there's drool all the way across the room going down the drain, and the dog just hit in the front of the cage trying to kill people. So I called the health department, and the health department guy, the environmentalist at the health department, said, well, I'm going to call the woman. I gave him the number and said, I'm going to tell her that she can either agree to put the dog down or to and get it tested, or we're going to, uh, I'm going to get a court order and I'll have it by this afternoon. The dog, there's no way he was going to live. He had like 106 temperature when we tested it. Couldn't check it at that point. But anyway, he was humanely euthanized, which was quite a trick. Had to get a rabies pole on him and a muzzle. And, but we got him safely done. And they had, they, the health department had somebody come pick up the dog. And they took it to Atlanta. We knew the results by that day. And he did not have it. He had canine distemper which is another preventable disease. Usually does not look like rabies, but it did in this case. It scared those people to death. So fortunately, all was well that ended well because the dog wasn't going to make it anyway. It was sad. All they needed to do was a shot. He would have been fine. Okay, arboviral encephalitis. Arboviruses are transmitted between a vertebral host and mosquitoes or ticks and human arboviruses that go from human to mosquito to human these are some of them toga virus flavivirus bunya viridae um, these are some others equine eastern equine encephalitis they are actually carried by birds usually blackbirds and it doesn't have to be a, like a red-winged blackbird or a regular blackbird or a raven. Any kind of bird that tends just that has this colored black. It could be other birds as well, but they're the most common for any of these encephalitis. But a mosquito bites them, and then it bites the horse. The horse gets it, and he's dead. Horses don't give it to you. They can't give it to you because they die of it. And they can't give it to you because they're dead. But the mosquito gives it to you. And about with this eastern equine encephalitis, about one third of people who get it will die of the disease. Others may be left with severe brain damage. And I remember someone in our neighborhood had a family member 
who lived in Florida that got the disease. And they lived of it, but they did have some brain damage. And there's a vaccine for horses, no vaccine for humans. But, I mean, who's more apt to get bitten by a mosquito, me or the horse? I mean, they're outside all the time. They don't come in. So it's just one of those things you want to keep the mosquitoes away from your house. You don't want to leave standing water. Now, Western equine encephalitis, same story, except it's out west. And you notice here, no licensed vaccine. There's no licensed vaccine for humans. There is a licensed vaccine for the horse. But generally, in this area, we only do the eastern encephalitis, unless we're taking our horses out west. And even then, there are maybe 15 or 20 a year horse cases. So it's not something I'd lay awake at night worrying about. St. Louis encephalitis, like same story, mosquito-borne, transferred from birds. La Crosse encephalitis, same story. But, and, and this one uh, can cause paralysis, brain damage, and death. The issue with these is they're not generally in this part of the country. West Nile encephalitis, I can't remember what year that came out. Uh, it's been quite a while. Transmitted by mosquitoes, it was strictly over around the Nile River, but uh, about 1% of the people who get it get a serious neurological infection. Uh, it also does infect horses, and they are dead-end hosts, but uh, I vaccinated mine one year, and you have to look at risk versus benefit. I had two horses get reactions to that vaccine the size of basketballs, and I just said, hmm, I think I'll pass on that, but most people get it, and they're fine. I, I know a woman whose father had it, and he had been out duck hunting in the swamps, and it was still warm, even though it's, you know how it is in Georgia, it's supposed to be winter, and it's still not. Well, he got it. He was in the hospital for a week or two on fluids, and he was fine. Fungal infections, it can cause uh, meningitis as a cryptococcus found in bird droppings. Enters the wound through, I mean, enters the body through inhalation or, and, or a wound, and it can cause either cutaneous form, pulmonary form, we've already talked about that, and it could cause meningitis. Toxoplasmosis. Uh, this is, uh, toxoplasmosis can affect many parts of the body. I think one of the biggest deal is if you're pregnant, you want to avoid getting it because it definitely will attack that uh, fetus and could cause brain damage, blindness, death, a lot of things. If you're excited about your pregnancy, you don't want the baby to get. And it can affect adults too. I, I talked to a doctor who lost a, an AIDS patient with toxoplasmosis. So a person who ha is immunocompromised needs to be very careful not to get it. Now, all the doctors want to blame it on infected cat turds. Cats catch it from eating mice that are infected. And this is a really, really weird disease. It, the, the cat eats the mice and becomes infected. And then the mice is infected from being around the turds and licking itself off. And it gets, it goes to his brain. And this disease, is, they've, seen there's videos of it and I didn't look for one but the mice think the mouse thinks the cat wants to be its friend now how weird is that and it'll come up and the cat wants to be its friend for a while but it does not fare well for the mouse and then he reinfects himself but in house cats I mean it's just how's a house cat gonna get rats unless you got rats all in your house um, also and they Doctors will tell you if you're pregnant, don't clean the litter pan. Well, if you wear gloves and you, if you want to, you could put on a mask and you use one of those scoop things 
and you, you need to clean it every single day though so they don't develop in that litter pan into a more mature uh, cyst so you want to definitely clean it every single day then you're not gonna you're not gonna get it from that where most get it is from undercooked meat and I was in a study I may have mentioned this in another PowerPoint but you may not have listened to it anyway we had which we compared the incidence of toxoplasmosis parasites in cat turds and in I should say cat feces and in raw hamburger meat and we found almost none in the cats we found a lot in the raw hamburger meat if you were to become infected with this speech difficulties seizures confusion lethargy and possibly death so the fetuses often die and uh, the young man with AIDS that the doctor I talked to had it uh, he died but most people get it they're going to be asymptomatic I have read an article and you know who knows where it'll go suspecting that parasites such as toxoplasmosis could cause some diseases uh, that develop when you get older such as I mean become an adult like schizophrenia who knows okay this is another interesting disease or two left uh, African sleeping sickness also African trypanosomiasis is caused by Trypanosoma brucei spread by the tsetse fly and a man from Nigeria said that's an incorrect, incorrect pronunciation though that's what biology teachers in Georgia call it tsetse fly he said they call it in Nigeria a tsetse fly uh, it's basically meningitis coma well first sleepiness coma and death Chagas disease is caused by trypanosoma cruzii and on the way I learned to memorize that was C is for C and you could see these on a blood smear and I'll try to put some photomicrographs in the lab section but you can see them on a blood smear just as clear as day both of these they're difficult to differentiate but if the person is in uh, Mexico or South Texas and they have granulomas all over their body and in their CNS it's probably Chagas disease whereas if they're in Africa and they've been be being bitten by TC flies or Setse flies is probably this one but this is a cool transmission it's really a gross transmission there's a bug called the redutavid bug also called the kissing bug I think there's only one eye in redutavid oh well but he the bug is this infected with it is carried in his feces he goes up and he bites you on the mouth and then he turns around and defecates in the wound on your mouth they do this when you're asleep and you don't know it and then you end up with this disease prion associated diseases also called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies these are rare they're infectious they're fatal neurodegenerative disease and they're caused by prions they're protein molecules and they fold abnormally and become an infectious particle what they do is if the protein is supposed to fold this way and this way and then one of them suddenly starts folding this way it becomes a template for a bad molecule it takes years to develop these in humans it impairs brain function memory personality changes dementia movement disorders and death always death eventually um, specific examples Kreutzville Jacob disease and I heard a lecture by one of the uh, number one experts in the world talk and that's the way he said it so I'm sticking with it Kreutzville Jacob 
and this is why that won't go smooth that was a straight line I drew guys this goes with this is why if you work in uh, central sterile you've got to be so careful any of these diseases are to get your instruments not just sterilized but they've got to be clean you got to get a brush and get all the blood out of the grooves in the instruments because it can live through being autoclaved well it can exist through being autoclaved once you get this disease you just are going to die you can treat them to you know for pain or spasms or whatever uh, but they do die and there have been some cases where people died of unknown causes and they did transplants with some of their organs this happened with rabies as well now if somebody dies of a motorcycle wreck or a car wreck I could see putting their organs but if someone dies with neurological disorder I don't think giving their organs is a good idea if you don't have a diagnosis but anyway so people died after getting I think kidneys and liver and I don't remember what else they gave somebody had donated the, the organs now variant also called new variant Creutzfeldt Jakob is rare fatal neurodegenerative condition and this is mad cow disease and when you have 16 year olds coming up with Alzheimer's conditions and dying in a few months you know there's a problem well they uh, they got it from eating the cows and the cows got it from being fed sheep brains that had scrapey so it's a lot of mess they had going on and it's not going on now I know it's illegal to feed any kind of meat product to cattle I have no idea how to say this one Gerstmann Strasser Stinkner syndrome somebody can help me on that if they decide they want to uh, and it is a prion protein that causes weird amyloid plaques and you die fatal familial insomnia so this one is going to be a if it's familial that sounds genetic to me but deterioration of mental and motor function and then death kuru is just the coolest of all though it's not cool if you're getting it but it's a fatal disease and it was among very common among the people of the four f-o-r-e in Papua New Guinea and the f-o-r-e four means the people because they didn't really notice there were any other people they lived in such an isolated area but it's caused by cannibalism now if you went and invaded their territory they'd kill you and eat you and have no problem with it and that's why it was very difficult I think it was up until maybe in the 70s or later before they finally got these people to realize cannibalism was killing them but they would say it wasn't evil to eat their family members in their mind to them they said well the, the soul of man resides you know in his body and especially in his brain and so if you bury him then he is doomed his spirit is doomed to live in darkness but if we have a big barbecue and eat him junior is going to live through us and continue to exist and there was a religion it's easy to criticize a religion but if you would told my granny there's no such thing as Jesus she would have taken her cane and whacked you I had kind of a mean granny she'd whack you if you didn't stand up straight too but let's think about how that they felt and it's really difficult you send missionaries they get eaten you send more missionaries they get eaten military guys they got eaten but eventually I don't know somebody got through animal prion diseases and any of these theoretically could be spread to humans bovine sp spongiform encephalopathy that is variant uh, Creutzfeldt Jacob in cattle chronic wasting diseases in deer but not in this area but still keep in mind don't eat the brains don't eat nervous tissue of any animal scrapie comes from goats 
transmissible mink encephalopathy, mink. Feline spongiform encephalopathy is in cats. I've been working in veterinary medicine a long time and, and I've never seen one of these. This is going to be something you're, I mean, I wouldn't just sit there and worry about your cat. And unless you're feeding him cow brains. Undulate sp spongiform encephalopathy. An undulate is a, any hoofed mammal. So it could be a horse or whatever. But this again, I've never really heard it. Now, scrapie I'm familiar with because there's a big effort by the Department of Agriculture to eliminate scrapie in the United States to try to get that prion out of our environment. Hey, that's all for this chapter.